Coming up on DTNS, big tech comes for small businesses. Snap is big in India, and Huawei, they're still trying. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, October 22nd, 2020, in lovely Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Rich Straffolino. In Oakland, California, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Remember, you can always get the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, by becoming a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. We were having scintillating conversations about when to buy a new microwave. Check that out uh, and join us uh, each and every weekday. Uh, but let's get started with a few tech things you should know. Google added a new price insights tool to Google Shopping, letting users see the average and range of prices for a searched product across the web. It also lets users track prices for specific products and receive price change notifications. The Central Bank of the Bahamas launched the first central bank digital currency, the sand dollar. The currency is backed at one-to-one -to, -one to the Bahamian dollar, which itself is pegged to the U.S. dollar. This will roll out in phases across the country, uh, focusing first on making sure banks and credit unions can meet compliance checks for the new currency to use in digital wallets. These wallets will require multi-factor authentication and be mobile-based. The central bank hopes the sand dollar will reduce financial service delivery costs and boost transactional efficiency for un, uh, underserved communities in the country. IBM and Pfizer have designed a new AI model to predict the onset of Alzheimer's. Instead of testing patients already exhibiting signs of the disease, researchers tracked healthy patients who had a genetic history of Alzheimer's or were in a high-risk category for developing the disease. Researchers used sample data from clinical verbal tests provided by the Framingham Heart Study, a long-term heart study tracking over 5,000 people and their families since 1948. The AI was able to correctly predict Alzheimer's close to 71% of the time, seven years before a patient was clinically diagnosed with the disease. With the launch of the PS5, the console's media center will automatically include major streaming apps such as Netflix, Disney+, Plus and Apple TV, as well as Spotify, Twitch, and YouTube. An Apple TV app is also coming to the PS4. And Apple retail chief, chief Deidre O'Brien said the company is expanding its Express Store formats with plans to expand from 20 to 50 across the U.S. and Europe. The format was designed to allow for social distancing and puts a wall in front of the main store, adds plexiglass protections for the sales counter, and limits accessory shelving. All right, we got some more stuff to talk about. So, Justin, what's going on with Huawei? What did they announce? Oh, I'd love to tell you, Rich. <laughs> Huawei announced the Mate 40 Pro, the first phone powered by its 5-nanometer Kirin 9000 chipset with an integrated 5G modem and a 24-core GPU. Huawei claims 10% better CPU performance and 52% better graphics than the Qualcomm Snapdragon 865 Plus. The phone offers the same 50 uh, megapixel main camera as the Huawei P40 Pro, but adds an ultra wide and 5X periscope zoom sensor, as well as an improved XD fusion engine for real time HDR video processing. The 40 Pro also supports 66 watt fast charging and runs Android 10 based EMUI 11. It ships in Europe uh, on November 13th for 1,199 euros. Huawei also announced the Mate 40 Pro Plus with 12 gigs of RAM and a longer zoom range on the rear camera and the standard Mate 40 with a smaller screen than the Pro, a less powerful Kirin 9000E chipset, and a smaller battery with 40 watt charging. No shipment dates on those two, but the Mate 40 will set you back 899 euros. So it's... It's interesting. Usually the narrative around, you know, when Huawei puts out a new phone is, oh, they're, they're you know, they're leading in or they're making really interesting design choices. They're using their own chipset. Uh, well, we, you know, we'll probably never see it in the U.S., maybe an interesting play in Europe or something like that. Obviously, the conversation, given the ongoing trade war, the, the you know, uh, the, the lack of available chips uh, and technology from a lot of American companies has kind of shifted that to where, you know, looking at the the surface of this announcement, Justin, I mean, we're talking, 
you know, fine, five nanometer chip, that's a, that's an advance on their process. You know, we can argue whether nanometers, you know, are, uni they're not really universal between comparing chips, but it's still an advancement in their chip processing. They have integrated 5G in their highest end phone, not something that Qualcomm currently offers right now. They're claiming better performance. Uh, you know, I, I think the conversation would be a lot different if for <laughs> the small fact that we don't know what their chip supply situation is kind of long, even even in the medium term, I would say. And uh, obviously it, it now lacks uh, the Google Play Store uh, support kind of having to roll their own uh, at this point. Yeah, you know, the, the future of Huawei was interesting before, considering we don't know exactly what their access are going to be to European markets based on everything that's happened over the last year. Uh, it will make it even more interesting. I don't know if there's a lot of clues that we can read into with this device, though, however, because the decisions made on this particular hardware were made I mean, maybe with the idea of, of the trade war in mind, but hopefully looking for sunnier days uh, ahead with that, and certainly not necessarily with the, uh, the, the, the pandemic factored in at all. Yeah, what I'll be looking for is what their supply is like maybe after launch. Because again, you know, you can, you can wait on the launch on this, right? Huawei is, is effectively playing in a much more limited market. So they can wait on the release of this for a little bit till they have some stock up. But a month, two months down the line after maybe there's an initial rush uh, domestically or in Europe, um, if they're able to keep units in stock, keep making chips. You know, we, we've heard Huawei executives say, we don't know how we're going to uh, you know, continue at volume producing, you know, a lot of our chips. So we will we will see how that goes. Next up here. So we had, uh, Justin, I believe a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that the Facebook Oversight Board was kind of going to uh, be getting started maybe in uh, early November, late October, something like that. That was kind of up in the air, but that it was it was coming, right? Yeah. Uh, now we have the word, though, that uh, the Facebook Oversight Board will start reviewing content moderation decisions starting today. So, Let's set the table. I thought it was important to kind of understand what this means, what this organization is, this, this body is all about, and, and kind of what their role will be going forward with when it comes to content decisions. This independent body will provide rulings on specific content takedown decisions with Facebook committing to follow the board's recommendations for specific instances. So for one piece of content, the board says something. Facebook says uh, if it was taken down, they will put it back up if that's what the board recommends. The board can also recommend platform policy changes based on those individual decisions, with Facebook saying it will review that guidance to determine if policy changes are needed, effectively not committing necessarily to following those uh, just based on, on the board's uh, recommendation. While initially users will be able to submit an appeal for content taken down by Facebook, the board will also review content left up when Facebook directly refers those decisions to them. Right now, though, ordinary users cannot uh, uh, kind of appeal, uh, leave up or t uh, leave up decisions uh, at this moment. Facebook does say that they're aiming to bring all content under the board's scope as quickly as possible. They're saying it's it's a technical limitation at this point. So, with all that being said, with that with that being their mission, how does this appeal uh, to the oversight board actually work? First, uh, a user has to go through a standard internal Facebook content appeals process. This is kind of through their internal tooling. Once that is exhausted, users will get a special ID that they can take to the Oversight Board's website to further submit a case. Cases are taken up to be heard by the board's 20 members that include former journalists, U.S. appeals court judges, digital rights activists, an ex-prime minister of Denmark, and one member of the Cato Institute. So kind of trying to cover their bases there when it comes to uh, perspective, seemingly. Four members of that, uh, or, uh, four members of that, of those 20 members were also uh, added to Facebook's board. So, you know, Justin, based on now we know, okay, they're they're starting today a little, maybe a little earlier than some earlier you know, the initial predictions or initial announcements. Um, what impact do you see this having in terms of uh, Facebook as a platform and the, perhaps more importantly to Facebook, their perception of content decisions on their platform? I would like to congratulate the Facebook Oversight Board on today, the greatest day of their lives. <laughs> Because uh, uh, as uh, Outcast told us once, from this point on, it only gets rougher. There, <laughs> there is absolutely no way that this in any way shields Facebook from the problems that they've had before. The fact that they are now putting this out to another board that now is going to seemingly with at least publicly facing less ties 
to the the organization itself, it's still the Facebook policy board, like like the, or oversight board. This is still an organization for which they're trying to farm out some of their bad reputation when it comes to not doing what their audience uh, likes. The simple fact is they're never going to stop having these problems. Moderating speech is literally their job as any of the admins and mods that are listening to my voice right now can attest. This is a thankless job. People are always going to be upset. I don't think that this necessarily does them any favors going forward. Do, I mean, it is does this board, at, at the end of the day, like maybe not initially, like you said, best day of their lives, congratulations. At some point, though, I mean, is is the hope of Facebook that they make they make the call? Transparency, that was, transparency yeah. is the best thing that can come out of this. Is that okay. at least you see the volume, and at least you see that there are decisions on having these people be articulated. Uh, uh, beyond that, I don't really see a ton of worry. The other question I have is in terms of volume. You know, Facebook has what almost uh, over two billion users, or somewhere somewhere close to there. I'm assuming there are a lot of content decisions that are made, and even if only a, a very small fraction of those ends up getting appealed there, I also think the problem just could be one of scale. Now, I know that they said technically they were, you know, they were working out technical issues probably to address some of that scale, but I also imagine the amount of cases that they're going to be able to take just in terms of like being humans that are looking at things, there's only so much time in the day. I do wonder if that will become an issue uh, down the road for them as well. Moving on, Snap saw its strongest growth in its Q3 earnings report with revenue up 52% on the year to $679 million, well ahead of analyst predictions of $127 million. Holy moly, big, big stacks for, for Snap. That's a big quarter on quarter daily active user growth was almost flat in the US and Europe. Snap saw them grow 13% quarter on quarter and 43% on the year elsewhere around the world. While Snap doesn't break out numbers by country in its earnings, it did say India was a huge growth market with almost 150% year-on-year daily active user growth in Q3 2020. Part of this was driven by efforts to localize Snapchat in the country with the app available in nine Indian languages and signing original content deals. Of course, this is also the first quarter reporting where TikTok has been banned in the country as well. Yeah, I looked it up, and TikTok was banned uh, toward the end of June, um, which both seems like three years ago and yesterday, weirdly enough, in 2020. Um, so this is like a clean quarter of a of a no TikTok India uh, where they have been operating here. Still, it's 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 kind of feeding into this this larger discussion that it, India is kind of. I, it, I don't think it's becoming. I think it, it certainly is, and a lot. Of, and clearly, we're seeing tech companies acting as if this is their next big, obviously, growth market. I mean, they have a billion people. Like, I'm not. I'm not saying anything that no one knows. But we're seeing, you know, significant investments when it comes to telecoms from Facebook. We're now seeing Snapchat, you know, certainly taking advantage of uh, a little bit of a vacuum in that market to drive their growth, but also making significant efforts. Uh, which I'm assuming are not cheap. You know, uh, the, the a lot of the articles from the uh, Economic Times of India had a really great uh, breakdown of some of the content deals they were signing. You know, they're, they're working with independent studios. They're redesigning the Discover page specifically, uh, or the Discover tab specifically for that market. Um, and uh, obviously seeing some success. You know, I think a lot of the, the talk with Snapchat recently is, oh, you know, they they can't compete with the numbers that you know Instagram stories are seeing what we see with every single Facebook report. Well, their their users in or outside the U.S. and Europe are about to exceed. They've already exceeded Europe. They're about to exceed uh, the you know in the U.S. Um, if they can keep that trajectory going, 150 percent obviously is not sustainable every quarter. Uh, but uh, uh, you know if they can uh, get that growth um, now, whether the the revenue from the users in those areas, uh, it's going to take some time for that to build up. That's kind of another the other the other question when it comes to this. Oh, it's a massive question because India has a, a very saturated market for smartphones. Mm -hmm. They have a tremendous demand for free content online. And so if Snapchat came in here and signed local content deals, and pe then people are going to want to be on the platform to do it. The question is, where do you go from there? And, and that's where you've seen a lot of growth in India have a hard time turning into profits because – this isn't the same kind of country in terms of, uh, of the money like the United States or many of the Western European countries. 
Yeah, and when we're, when we're talking about ARPU, um, it should be noted that while their growth was flat, their earnings per average revenue per user, right, uh, was up like 20%. I, I don't want to say it was double digit, though, uh, growth when it came to the US, Europe. It was actually down on the year when it came to the rest of the world and it was up like five or six percent uh, on the quarter. So, you know, yeah, the, the revenue question, that's a big one. Still, not a bad thing for one, for from a snap perspective, to kill it on the uh, the revenue, and then also uh, to put up some some nice uh, uh, user numbers. Something uh, they haven't been able to say every quarter for sure. All right, and remember, uh, thank you to all those who participate in our subreddit. Remember, you could submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. All right, so for uh, you know, Justin, I want to talk to you about this because you know you're a you're a man of of many ventures, uh, uh, many uh, uh, activities, and I thought you know we've seen a, a couple of pieces that will uh, that, uh, tech pieces that are designed to kind of speak to small business. I want to get your take on them. Uh, first up here, uh, WhatsApp for Business kind of has become uh, an increasingly important part for a lot of small businesses when it comes to messaging, integrating that into their platforms and stuff like that. So they are rolling out, Facebook announced that they're rolling out in-chat shopping for the first time, letting merchants link to products and services with the option to buy without leaving the interface. This is for Facebook-specific catalogs, but also for third-party stuff as well. I'm sure there will be a preference there, I'm sure. Uh, merchants will also be able to add a buy button to other lo online locations, which will then take WhatsApp uh, open users into a WhatsApp chat to complete the purchase. The company also announced plans to launch Facebook hosting services aimed at small and medium businesses using WhatsApp Business API that will let them use Facebook's own secure hosting infrastructure for free. Don't have a lot of details on it, but Facebook has promised more as it gets closer to launch, which right now is unknown. So a lot of questions there. Anytime you have free and, and small businesses, kind of an interesting proposal, especially when you have kind of, uh, I don't know, a, a viral hit when it comes to uh, WhatsApp for business, uh, you know, Justin, in, in terms of this kind of business messaging, we've seen Facebook kind of uh, realizing, hey, we can monetize messaging in a whole lot of ways. They're integrating uh, Instagram and Facebook messaging. They're adding all sorts of uh, features uh, for businesses on there. They've opened up that API we just covered, I believe, this week. Uh, you know, WhatsApp for business is in chat shopping, uh, the new hotness coming up. Well, it's not new. Well, yeah, it's certainly true. not new internationally. Uh, it has not taken off in America, but it's also kind of an interesting place where in chat shopping would be because a lot of the concept of chatting, as we had previously understood its success, is on some level dependent on, or at least the examples that we used were on physical. Meeting, uh, where are we gonna meet up? Oh, we should all buy movie theater tickets together <laughs> or let's order a, a Uber or Lyft via your your your, 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 your chat interface. So I, I don't know whether or not in a world where you are at home a lot more in a pandemic world, you know, uh, with more tools at your fingertips, if, if this is necessarily going to be uh, something that will explode. That being said, Facebook having more of a hosting infrastructure, that makes a whole lot of sense. Because as we're going to see with this next story as well, everybody has to understand that digital is the future. Any any moment, because digital is the present right now. Now that, <laughs> now that everybody understands that you have to have a better website, you have to have an online engagement, then maybe for those that are focused on, on some of the uh, chat side stuff, they'll want an easier off the rack tool and Facebook will be there to offer it to them. And then I'm sure Jack the price later. <laughs> well, that's the other thing is that Facebook essentially signaled, uh, they said they're exploring ways to further monetize uh, uh, WhatsApp uh, for business, basically saying at some point you're going to have to start uh, paying for some of these services that we've yeah. been offering for free. Interesting. Also, I you know I, I feel like WhatsApp is at least in the U.S. is a little bit of the the forgotten platform. Uh, when, if if any of Facebook's platforms can be forgotten, it has billions of users, tons of people use it. But in terms of like being able to to monetize that, it's it's really interesting if uh, adding adding the the services aspect to it adding maybe some sort of tiered pricing and stuff like that, uh, the impact that that could have, especially if they can offer then value, you know, if, if they're charging money, I'm assuming they would have to add some sort of additional value, uh, take some kind of IT pressure off places that should not be doing IT anyway, I, you know, mom and pop businesses, uh, you know, could be, a, could be a totally new direction uh, for WhatsApp. 
Uh, another totally new direction, though, that I want to talk to you about, Justin, is CNBC reports that J.P. Morgan Chase, a uh, big old stodgy bank, plans to roll out Quick Accept, a new fintech service for merchant payments. Payments are made either in an app or through a contactless reader that you can buy, and there's no additional fee to receive funds that same uh, day, something that can't be said for all aspects of things like Square or PayPal services necessarily. Um, all transaction fees, though, would apply, so you're still kind of dealing with that. J.P. Morgan plans to migrate a large portion of its 3 million small business customers to a new Chase Business Complete Banking offering that includes Quick Accept, and they waive the fees if you meet some nominal uh, uh, balance or uh, you know transaction volume. The company piloted Quick Accept in Utah earlier this year. Clearly, they like what they saw, and they are planning uh, a wider rollout. Uh, so, you know, I saw uh, CNBC reporting that uh, you know Square shares were reacting uh, to this news. I guess. Uh, it, 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 is this a uh, Chase is coming for Square, or is this Chase realizing, hey, um, we need to, you know, we need we we need to compete in this uh, kind of this new, or not even this new landscape, the current existing landscape for a lot of these small businesses. I think it's very smart. It, it, it's J.P. Morgan Chase is a brand that a lot of people that don't know what Square is recognize that that they recognize this is the line of credit that I run my business on. This is how. Uh, uh, I, I normally move my money. This is, these are the banks that I am normally dealing with. They may or may not, you know, everybody's listening to this is probably aware of Square from the from the the, the dongle phase now <laughs> our, our contactless present. But this just goes back to every single one of these stories. If you were to look at it at the beginning of the year before COVID, you'd say, oh, look, makes sense that J.P. Morgan Chase is doing it. At this point, when we have seen a quantum leap forward in terms of user acceptance on a lot of different uh, uh, technological fronts, the, the back-end side of this is just a no-brainer. It, it, is, it is something that, especially as, I mean, if, if let's say American culture tends to go in the same way that uh, many Asian cultures have, who are very focused on virus stuff in a way that Americans have not up till this point, and contactless becomes a bigger and bigger way that people pay for things, then you're just going to need it. Like, they, this is just going to be something that you're going to want more uh, uh, access to. So, uh, I, absolutely. I, I do think that this is not only well uh timed but it's it's mm. necessary for jp morgan chase yeah and and i think the thing that jp morgan chase maybe likes the best i this is my opinion 95 percent of the people in that utah trial were new to the bank and two-thirds of them were from uh businesses that had been less than a year old so you know kind of courting a totally new uh, uh kind of bank you know uh, finance market for them i'm sure has a not insignificant appeal all right, and finally here, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee voted to authorize subpoenas requiring Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg and Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey to testify regarding the platform's recent policy enforcement decisions regarding a New York Post story about Hunter Biden. You may have heard of it. The motion to issue subpoenas did not list a date for testimony. So, Justin, the, uh, you know, I guess what can we expect from these proceed? Like, what, I guess... What can these platforms say? Twitter's already changed its hacked materials policy, like literally the day after uh, they enforce it, you know, now going to only enforcing it if the the actual attackers are leaking that material. Um, you know, are we going to hear about lessons learned? Are we going to is this just the first step in a much bigger proceeding? Oh, this is a tempest in a teapot. This won't be the first time that Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey get uh, uh, subpoenaed by Congress. We'll find out exactly if and when this will even happen, because it's likely not going to happen within the next 12 days before the election. And, and then at that point, this will probably get lumped into some other thing that Congress is very mad at Facebook and Twitter <laughs> about. But it, it is... I don't know. This would not happen if the election weren't here and everybody was all ratcheted up. The issues underlining this are very real and will likely wind up becoming there. There will be another news peg to to have this conversation with these particular with these CEOs. But uh, I don't think that this particular issue would rise to the level of congressional subpoena if we were not 12 days away from the election. <laughs> uh, it is interesting. We've, we've kind of seen this move of. Uh, we're going to issue this motion for the subpoenas, a.k.a. give ourselves some more time to negotiate about 
we, we've seen this in a number of different aspects uh, when it comes to kind of the big tech CEOs uh, before Congress. So you're absolutely right, especially given the proximity of the election where we will see this. I do wonder, though, if this is where uh, maybe not in this particular instance, but in a in a similar situation, if this is something where a Facebook oversight committee, um, <laughs> you know, uh, might provide some cover if they if they said we made this decision in consultation with this independent body of experts, yada, yada, yada. Uh, does that, uh, I guess, does that does have it, any does currency that immediately on Washington? Does tank the reputation of the independent body if they don't make a decision that the people that are complaining the loudest uh, want them to make? Yes, <laughs> indeed, it would immediately tank their reputation. Uh, as for the ins and outs here, uh, I mean, these kinds of hearings are often more for the press than they are for any kind of edification. That being said, uh, the wild bottle rocket without a stem uh, a decision making process for twitter does beg for more inquiry i don't quite know if the senate judiciary committee is going to be the ones to give it to us well justin maybe we'll get some sort of uh, edification from our mailbag uh, what have we got in there today Nick writes, in regards to the discussion between Tom and Scott about the value of Game Pass, I personally am a person that buys games because I want to own them. Yet, I'm still subscribed to Game Pass. For me, Game Pass is like a modern version of the old video shops when I was a kid. I would almost always rent a game from the local shop before buying it with Game Pass. I can download a game, play it for as long as I like, and decide if it is worth buying. Sure, I could rely on Steam refunds to do this, but... Sometimes you need to play a game for more than two hours to figure out if you like it or not. This way, I can properly try a game before I buy. Justin, do you have uh, sympathies uh, for this position? I find I'm the same way with music. Uh, I subscribe to uh, streaming services. I can get any song that I want, but I will still go and buy... You know, if the Beths come out with a new record, I'm going to buy that, uh, even though I can get... I already have it on my phone. Yeah, I, I, I'm 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 all in on the streaming model. Uh, they they have they have given me the ability to listen to everything I want, unless it is somebody a band that I really want to support financially. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I I won't uh, do that with music. I I will jump in and say I am totally with Nick. I am the kind of person that used to rent games and see if I liked it, and then I would actually go out and buy it because it was a very inexpensive way, because I had a discount at my local video store for video games, um, to, t to test it, because you get a lot of reviews, you get online reviews, but oftentimes what they like may not be the same thing that you like, and you really have to test out, especially since the number of demos that, the, that, that get released for games has dropped uh, compared to like even 15 years ago. So. Oh, man, the demo CD. It was the best. Uh, <laughs> if you have uh, thoughts about buying, streaming, renting, faxing, update it, uh, send it to us at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Of course, we need to give a shout-out to our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Reed Fischler, Mark Gibson, and Chris Smith. Thank you so much. And, of course, thank you to Justin Robert Young. Justin, where can people uh, find more of your great stuff if they are so inclined? Uh, the finale of my uh, political history podcast, Raise the Dead, is out right now. The final episode, The Man Who Got Everything You Wanted, chronicles Lyndon Baines Johnson ascending to the role of president after the uh, murder of John F. Kennedy. And it does something that we have never had in the history of Raise the Dead, and that is our subjects, or our subject in his own voice. A uh, fun history fact that you might not know those tape machines that got Nixon in so much trouble during Watergate were not installed by Dick. No, they were put in by LBJ. He recorded all of his phone conversations, and we use them tremendously in this last episode. If you don't like it, then you're not going to like anything that we do. It's been called one of the, or the, 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 the one episode that if you've never listened to Raise the Dead, you should try out this one by my friend Brian Brushwood. I'm very proud of it. Go ahead and check it out right now. Raise the dead podcast.com. And I will safely say the best tension hook uh, uh, sound effects in the business uh, on Raise the Dead. So uh, highly recommended. Thank you, Justin, for that amazing Thank podcast. Uh, if you want to, of course, if you want to get some DTNS as a video podcast, and why wouldn't you? You get to see me and Justin smiling faces. Get the video RSS feed at dailytechnewsshow.com slash subscribe. And you can always support the show at any level, dailytechnewsshow.com slash Patreon. Patreon. I don't know why I said that word. You know what it is. Yeah, it's fine. 
All right, we'll be live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at visitexnewshow.com slash live. We'll be back tomorrow with Patrick Thornton, Len Peralta, and, of course, Tom Merritt. Until then, have a super special day. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>